Welcome to the Francisca Show podcast on jewishcoffeehouse.com, the show where I give a voice to Jewish issues, topics, and people. I'm Francisca, your host. Welcome back, Francis. Today we have an episode with a father who shares his perspective and story about his child who was born with a syndrome. Found this episode to be super meaningful, and I hope you will too. Our throwback episode for today is semi-related to this episode because it is about the perspective of a parent, but specifically the mother. So check out the episode with Bora Enten on infertility, postpartum, anxieties, and pregnancy loss. A very informative talk with a therapist who specializes with moms, postpartum moms. It is episode 38. And the link is in the show notes. Next week, we will have an episode with a genetic counselor who is orthodox. And she talks all about the risks we have as from Jews, as Ashkenazi Jews, and Sephardi Jews, and all the risks we have with genetics. So I hope you find this episode to be interesting and meaningful. Keep reaching out. I love hearing from you. And enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Francisca Show, Fran Stans. Today with us, we have Ari Mark, and he's here to share about his journey as a parent of a child with special needs and to share how that, how that affected your relationship with God. We'll start here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here. Ari, tell us a little bit about who you are professionally, religiously, and in your stage of life, give us some background. Um, pretty much just a regular guy. I live in Los Angeles in my mid forties. I work in the real estate business and have four children. My background is, you know, I grew up in what I would call a pretty traditional modern Orthodox type of background. Went through the basic uh, yeshiva day school system here in Los Angeles, where I'm from. Spent a couple years in Israel. Went to the yeshiva that no longer exists called Ner Yaakov and uh, then spent some time in YU. A little bit more time learning after that. And then got married and started the what I'd call the second chapter of uh, the journey of my life. But more or less just a regular guy. How do you go from regular guy to not your typical guy anymore? What changes in your life? Well... You know, I think I think that uh, I'm I'm still a, a pretty regular guy. You know, I grew up. I tell my kids all the time that they think that I'm a loser these days. I'm not like a cool kid, and I tell them all the time that I was I was one of the more popular kids growing up at every stage. So they should just remember because one day they're going to end up just like me. No matter how cool you think you are now, it always changes. So um, I grew up as a you know a pretty typical kid. Uh, it was a popular kid. I was a little bit of a crazy kid. Always looked for a lot of attention. I wasn't what I would call a particularly thoughtful kid. Not not necessarily in the sense that I was a bad kid or anything like that, but I just wasn't thoughtful. I think like most people, you kind of go through life as a child and you do the things that you enjoy doing. And sometimes that's at the expense of others. Sometimes it's it's not. And I kind of went through life like that. And honestly, I went through life like that in college. I went through life like that in my initial married life. I kind of just assumed like, things will just fall into place. You know, I'm me. So like, you know, things have worked out so far. They're going to continue to work out. Why not? In large measure, I've always kind of approached life in a certain way like that. You know, you just kind of got to roll with the punches, do your thing. There's times that I guess that type of mentality is very positive. There's times that it's not. I would say that the, you know, obviously having a child with special needs clearly shifted the way I look at things. But I, I, I'm not exactly sure how that happened or when that happened. It just kind of happens. And I would say even now, outside of certain aspects of my life, I still largely try to operate that way, which is obviously I don't want to be thoughtless uh, and I'm a much more thoughtful person, but I try to think more about just the present moment and not worry so much about what what's going to happen later and, and you know things like that. Is your child with special needs your oldest? Yes. And, and I, I would say that when your oldest child has special needs, and in particular our, our case, our son is to some degree undiagnosed. They believe that it's some sort of a genetic disorder that at some point in time 
you know, when they have the full genetic mapping, they'll be able to, you know, identify what it is. But we didn't have like one of those come to Jesus moments, right? It's not, we didn't have a child with Down syndrome where you can see that the child has some form of special needs. We didn't have any, any kind of like experiences like that, which is partially why there was no kind of like immediate type of transition. You know, when I got married, I was the type of person who was kind of, again, let's just enjoy, do what we're going to do. My wife, who's much wiser than I, she wanted to have children right away. I probably would have chosen not to, not, not again, not from a thoughtful perspective, but more that, you know, let's just, you know, do our thing and see what happens. And I will say that something that I, that I've been thinking about a lot over the last you know couple of years, and I've been talking about a lot is that one of the, and, and my wife gets a lot of credit for this. One, one of the, one of the tricks in life, I think, is that when you're young, the things that are really, really important to you, whether it's, you know, ambition, financial success, whatever it is, those things tend to become less and less important as you get further on in life. And that shift, you know, for a lot of people, unfortunately, only happens when they're really late in life. And the trick is that the things that you know are going to be most important to you in life at the end, you want to try to kind of shift and bring those forward as much as you possibly can early in life so you can spend most of your time with that. My wife wanted to have children right away. And I wasn't necessarily, uh, that wasn't something that I would necessarily push for. And I tell my kids today that uh, it were up to me. I'd love to see them at every single stage in life. I want to see my kids as babies, as teenagers, as young adults, as parents. I also want to see them as grandparents. And obviously, I'm not going to be able to do that. But the wisdom of having children early means that you're going to get to see and be part of so much more. And anything else that you experience early in life, uh, before you have your kids, there's no doubt that all of us would give it up in a second at the end of our life just to have a little bit more time to see them a little bit further. And to me, the trick is to try to figure out how to shift that as fast as you can and as early as you can. And in this respect, my wife was completely on target. She understood that there's no question that the things that are going to be important late in life, let's, let's start that now. And we started to try to have kids. And when my son was born, you know, there was really nothing that seemed out of the ordinary. He was, everything seemed more or less fine. My wife could probably tell you all the details of like the small things that kind of might've been red flags that were to us. Well, can you think of one or two for us? He had a heart murmur, which is not a crazy thing to have, but he had some issue with his heart, which again was a minor issue that did not necessarily mean anything at the time. And what started to happen was he also, again, in his first few months, he, rather than like spitting up and having normal gestation, like normal kids, he would literally like throw up all the time. And the doctors were like, yeah, that's pretty normal until he literally threw up once all over the doctor when the doctor was burping him. And the doctor's like, that's what you mean? And my wife's like, I've been telling you that for like months. And he's like, no, that's, that's like crazy. Like we have, you know, what's going on with that. And even that, again, that was just, nobody said to us, oh, he's got this issue. Maybe there's something wrong. It was more like any typical thing a kid might have, a baby might have. So we just got to look into it, but everything's fine. And then when my son was eight months, he didn't meet a milestone. And his, his mommy and me, uh, the person who was running it, noticed it and just said to us, I'm just kind of letting you know, he hasn't met this milestone. You should pay attention to it. You should just let the doctor know. You should just be aware of it. Can you share what that milestone is? Or I think I've had to do a sitting up. It, it wasn't, it wasn't a, again, it was a, okay. a minor type of a thing. Okay. So no problem. And my wife told the doctor at one of the next appointments. And that shortly after that, we got a phone call from my doctor, an incredible human being, aside from being a wonderful doctor, an incredible human being. And he said he'd like to come and visit us. So that was a little out of the ordinary. Like, why is the doctor coming to visit us? Now I know him personally, but okay. So he shows up and he basically sits us down and he says to us, I don't want you to, I want to talk about something serious, but. I don't want you to be scared or worried because it might be absolutely nothing. And he basically said that in three different areas, our son seems to have some issue. So he had the heart murmur, he had the GERD issue, and then he didn't sit up. And he said, when you see three issues, that kind of hints to syndrome. And he said, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong, but I just wanted to come and talk to you about it so that you're aware of it. I want you to pay attention to certain things. And that was 
the beginning of us, of this journey in terms of hearing that our son might have special needs. Now, my personality is such that it really didn't register. In other words, I heard what the doctor said, but I also heard the doctor say it might be nothing at all. So my approach to everything is okay. Like it'll be, I'm sure it'll be fine. And that kind of led us, you know, he used to recommend us go to certain doctors, developmental neurologists, things like that. But again, all part of a process of caution and less of issue at that time. And for a good few years, the message that we heard is, oh, he's just delayed. I'm probably like six months behind and I'm sure he'll catch up. And that went on for, for quite a long time. And at some point in time, I don't know if my wife and I arrived at this place at the same time, but at some point in time, even while I was still hearing things like that, it became very apparent. It was probably three or four um, that the story is not going to be the story, the six months behind concept and all of that. Like he's not, he's clearly not progressing typically. And I think having that period of time of slowly kind of integrating the new reality for me was very helpful because again, there was no kind of a shock moment. Uh, I, I don't know that, that had I had that kind of shock moment that I would have reacted differently because I'm a relatively easygoing person. I did when my son was born, I freaked out, but it wasn't because of anything other than like, oh my God, I got to take care of somebody now. Like this is kind of insane. So I think for me, I probably would have handled it relatively well, whatever that means. But certainly not to, with, with I, I would say, the kind of ease that I had kind of going into it where it was, it was kind of already our life. Like we were already, you know, running around to doctors. We were already seeing that he wasn't exactly developing normally. Instead of spitting up like a typical kid, the kid was like hurling everywhere all the time, like literally wherever we would go, you know, so like the, the challenges of like having a kid who isn't behaving in the typical manner, all those kinds of things we were just, we were experiencing and it's all that I knew and I didn't know any better. So that was kind of the beginnings, the very early beginnings of the journey of kind of learning what was going on. Thanks for sharing that. So let's move along a little bit. I'd like to touch upon the dynamic of having more kids and how that affects the family dynamic and or you, whatever you feel is more relevant first, talking about that social aspect. Do you try to find a community around other families who have children with special needs? Do you shy away from families who have typical kids? Talk to me about the, that social aspect as well. You know, socially, thankfully, we've always done pretty well. I, I will say that there was a moment in time where some of the people that we were social with somehow couldn't handle the full package. Either it was their kids or them, and, and there was what I would call a moment in time where we kind of had to distance ourselves from relationships, certain relationships in a certain way. But I would say our experience is unique. We're extremely blessed. First, we're blessed that we live in an amazing community and a community that I've personally been a part of my whole life. And I have a lot of old friends. My parents have a lot of old friends. My grandparents were in this community. So it makes it hard for people not to treat us nicely. We know them, we're coming back and that's a big advantage. Also, my wife and I in general do well socially. Not everybody who has children with special needs have that luxury. A lot of times they themselves are a little bit isolated. It's a very tricky thing because when you look at community, to insert yourself in a community that's all people like you is hard. I can tell you that the only day of the year that is a day that is hard for me is visiting day at Camp Ask. Camp Ask is the most magical place on the planet. The people at Camp Ask are the most incredible human beings that I've ever met. But it's the one day where I, I used to joke around, you know, when I would go, I'd see people who I haven't seen in years. And the first, and some of them I didn't really know, they went to college with me, whatever it was, but I recognize them. So you have that first moment where you're like, oh yeah, I know that guy. And then you're like, oh yeah, he's got one too. You know, like, it's like this like two, two step process and like, when that second step happens and you're, you're surrounded by all these people who are in your similar situation, that's the day that I feel like I'm the parent, like consciously that I'm the parent of a child with special needs. When I'm not in that environment, I know I have a child with special needs. I know that it's extraordinarily challenging. I know all the, you know, everything that comes along with it. But it's not your identity. Right. I, I just don't feel like 
that I'm isolated in this like world of special needs, even though I am. For some people, I'm sure that they get a lot of support from that and it helps them. For me, trying to be normal, whatever normal means, is where I find for myself the best course. And that's very tricky because at the same time, a lot of people do feel very isolated. And the message that I try to tell people who ask me that question is, I know as a parent with a child with special needs, there's very little upside in, in taking chances, right? So, you know, going to the movies, let's just use an example. Somebody goes to movies and they enjoy movies. Well, there's really no upside in taking your child with special needs to the movies because in most cases, certainly with my son, he's not going to enjoy it at all. So there's no, it's not like he's going to go there and it's going to be amazing. He's just as happy walking around the streets of my neighborhood looking for mailmen. But the downside is if he goes crazy and I have this massive breakdown, it's a terrible experience that I generally have a view in life. Only make decisions that have upside. Don't make decisions that have either downside or a neutral. Only make decisions where there's a possibility of upside. So when you think about community, it's a very challenging thing because do you take your child to shul, right? Is there really any upside in doing that? And in, in many cases, there probably isn't. And that's a function of the fact that the communities aren't really set up to have a lot of these kids there. At the same time, I tell people the reason that my son has thrived and does so well is because we essentially bring him everywhere and we do everything with him. And when we go out to people's homes on Chavez, we take him with us. If he doesn't want to be there, we send him to do other things, but we try to incorporate him as much as possible. And my overall feeling is that a person has to, number one, be comfortable bringing their child places and at the same time, they have to be comfortable that it's not going to work out all the time and that it's not going to, that the community and the people around don't have to accommodate all the time, but they do need to accommodate some of the time, but they're only given that opportunity if you bring them. And for us, our son's a rock star and he's brought social relationships to us in, in a, an incredible way. Our friends are incredible with our son and not everybody has those opportunities. My other kids... There was a period of time that we were concerned, how are they going to relate to him? How are they going to, in general, how are they going to do in terms of seeing the sacrifices that sometimes we have to make for our other son? But I think the fact that our son is so well integrated in the community and our friends and our community are so good to him, our other kids get to see that. And with all the sacrifices that they may have to make, being able to see how well and how integrated our son is and how the community celebrates him the way that they do, it's hard not to feel really good about that. Wherever my son goes, people will, just random people we don't even know, will yell across the street, hey, yo-yo, oh, there's yo-yo, whatever it is. And our kids see that. And that's true when we're in New York. It's true when we travel to Israel. It's true here in Los Angeles. It's true when we go to 7-Eleven. It's true wherever we are. Now, not, that, that's something that I think is, is unique to us. But we, we've thrived socially our children have thrived socially and our son has thrived socially so first i want to comment on the trick you mentioned before the trick is to focus on the things that you're gonna think or feel are most important to you at the end of life or toward your second part of your life that is called the yeshiva system slash jewish orthodox life at least or maybe it's a gender issue but everything is about olam haba you know you go to kindergarten everything is you know do as many mitzvahs now because what's important is olam haba i'm wondering if you your realization is a gender thing because i feel like girls are always focused on you know what's important when you grow up and everything you do now is so when you're older and etc maybe i'm wrong you know, I don't have a good answer to that question. I don't view my comment as strictly a religious comment and a comment in terms of, of Olam Haba per se. That was an example. No, I understand. I, I view it more as, I, I think about it in the sense that all of us, if we were to, for a moment, kind of take a step back and be honest with ourselves of what's actually most important to us, we will arrive at different things than what seems on a cursory level to be important to us. But life is complicated and it's busy and there's so much. And that distracts us from the things that really are critical. And different people have different moments in their life when there, there's clarity. And the key is to try to focus in on that. I often say the tragedy of me is that the person that I've become 
And I'm sure there's a, plenty of runway left in, in the person that I need to be. But even the person that I've become, I would never have become were not for my son. But there are people who choose to be that person without any impetus, just because it's the right thing, just because they've taken the time to be thoughtful and to consider their life and to consider the impacts that they want to make. I really think, I, I don't think it's a gender thing. And my experience isn't that women are more focused on that per se. You know, my wife was certainly more focused on that in the context of children. Okay. That, that's valid. <laughs> okay. Next, I wanted to focus more on examples of how your life is different because of your son. That's a tough uh, question, even so, though my life is entirely different. But um, You could take us through a day and just maybe comparing. Yeah, I'm sure you know what to say. I was a crazy kid. And when I say crazy, again, I don't mean bad, but I was a kid whose entire life was about having fun and about doing things that I thought were funny, enjoyable, ridiculous, and I, like I said early on, I wasn't thoughtful. I was just doing things. Most of my life at this point, in my adult life certainly has been about other people, not about myself. I wake up in the morning. I wake up relatively early. Immediately, I'm taking care of my son. I'm getting him ready for school. I'm giving him my cell phone. I'm getting him dressed. My, my whole life, in a certain regard, has been hijacked by my son. Now, when I say hijacked, it sounds in a negative connotation, but it's become entirely about about taking care of him. And in addition to that, my family as a whole. And there's very little at this point that I focus on in terms of myself. A very basic example is I used to love to dress nicely. And I was very into, I'd like to go to malls and shop and buy nice clothes and all that kind of stuff. And then at a certain point, I realized, oh my God, my son, like he basically throws up on me 50 times a day, right? So in the beginning, it was more like, okay, so I still like the nice clothes, but, you know, I just won't wear them during the day. And I remember when I started, like I had a transition. I only, I was only wearing jeans because it's much easier to just throw them into the, to the wash. It's no, not a big deal, whatever. And then I remember when I went from like button down shirts to now I exclusively wear long sleeve t-shirts. The same thing. I don't want my arms exposed because my son drools a lot. He throws up a lot. I mean, now he doesn't throw up as much, but things like that happen. I'm I'm just, I'm a much more roll up your sleeves kind of guy with him. So I don't like any exposure. So I wear long sleeve t-shirts, easily throw in the garbage. I wear synthetic kind of pants that he can drool all over. I can be on the floor cleaning stuff up. It's nothing. So like, that's one like tiny little detail in my life, but every aspect of my life has changed to in some way, be able to manage better the overall situation that we have, the way that I spend my time, just everything. Talk to me about your relationship with him. Uh, my son is a magical kid. He's very funny. We spend a lot of time together. How old is he? He's almost 18 now. For many years, my Sundays were taking him to look for FedEx trucks and then riding the bus up and down the main street here in Los Angeles, basically going to the beach and then back. I'd say that I'm very close with my son. It's a different kind of relationship because we can't bond in certain areas. He doesn't talk to me about being on the basketball team and the things that are on his mind and the things that bother him like my other son does. But we spend a lot of time together and I'm able to see just the incredible purity of the person. One, one of the beautiful things about kids with special needs is that everything about them is raw. So their emotions are totally raw. Their happiness is so real and so pure. Their sadness is so real and so pure. Their transparency is so incredible. The things that most people chase after are totally irrelevant to these individuals. And what they care about are people who are nice to them. They care a lot about that. And then the things that might pique their interest. And I just spent so much time with my son. I feel like I'm incredibly blessed to be able to do that. Every Shabbos, I spend Shabbos morning walking with him from shul to shul. He loves chillant, so we go and we uh, eat chillant at literally every shul in Los Angeles, literally place to place. Almost every night, including Motze Shabbos, we go on a drive and look for the mailman, and he's made a lot of friends with a lot of the different mail carriers, UPS men, FedEx guys, and we go and hang out together with them. And we just spend an enormous amount of time together. 
And that includes doing things that are sometimes difficult. I have to shower him. I have to oftentimes when he uses the bathroom, I have to help him. I got to get him dressed. The types of things that the first time you do certain things, it's hard. And then you kind of get used to it and it becomes part of your routine. But my son is, he's, he's funny. All of my friends he's got relationships with and everybody knows his shtick. And I'm very blessed in that way. I tell people often that in life, that nobody gets off scot-free. Everybody has some form of challenge. We're incredibly blessed that we love our challenge to death. You know, if a person has financial troubles, they want it to go away. If a person, God forbid, is ill, they want it to go away. We have a challenge and it's a big one and it's constant and the intensity in many ways grows as they get older, but we love it. And that's an incredible, incredible blessing. And even things and people we love, we still need help sometimes and accept it. Do you have help? And what are some of the forms of help? You know, over the years, the way that we've had help has changed and different periods of time affected him and us differently. Obviously, like a period of time like COVID was, was very, very, very challenging. We've always had some form of help. Currently, we have an angel among men, this gentleman, he's a behaviorist by the name of Freddie. And Freddie, we met right before COVID. And Freddie started to do something with the Onatan that in the, the beginning was very, very hard for us, but has been incredible. Shabbos afternoons, I used to spend with my son after doing chillin'. We would go to our friends, different friends house. I'd walk with him to different places. And sometimes we had people who did that with him. And he would go from one friend to the next and they had some treats for him, whatever it was. When Freddie kind of showed up, Freddie decided that it was time for Yonatan to focus more on life skills. And we had behaviorists who were working with him through the services that we got. And Freddie just decided that he's going he's gonna to make this change in Yonatan's life. And he began taking Yonatan on Shabbos to different places, whether it was grocery stores or clothing stores or things like that, to try to teach him how to behave appropriately in those different contexts and how to learn how to be to some degree self-sufficient. So Freddie has you know, been with us for a few years now, and he spends a lot of time with Yonatan over the weekends, Sundays and on Shabbos. My family has always been an incredible support. When we were going through these challenges early on, we used to drop my son off at my parents' house, and we, ne we didn't know this at the time. But every Sunday afternoon, my father would take my son to random places, to aquariums and to the mall, to, to the swings, to this, whatever it was. And it's important to have help because it's impossible to do it on your own. I don't care who you are with all the help. And we have, thankfully, a fair amount of help. It's still never enough. I could have help every day and it's still not enough. It's impossible to be able to stay a healthy, normal human being and accomplish everything that you need to accomplish without, number one, specific help, without social help, without community help. It's just, it's impossible. I'm thankful you're saying this because that's my motto right now. <laughs> and it's just like the help is never enough. And I don't even have a child with special needs and it's just. Yeah. Like and I, I tell people all the time, there's no, you don't have to martyr yourself because you're going to martyr yourself. It's a, you don't even have to think about like, oh, it's going to happen no matter what. When you're raising a child with special needs, there are massive sacrifices that are coming and incredible blessings. But don't feel bad asking for help. Don't feel like, oh, people pity me. It's okay. You know, my, my wife sometimes says she hates that people pity us. And I, I have a different approach. I'm okay with it. Pity me. Help me. If I'm coming to shul and you see I'm having a problem, feel bad for me and, and make it okay that the kid's having a problem. Don't make an issue out of it. If you're my friend and, you know, you see that, uh, you know, it's hard for me, you know, offer to take my kid on a walk. It's, I'm okay with that. You know, you, you can't do it on your own. These children and these individuals, particularly as they get older and they want more independence, you can't be everywhere all the time. You can't do everything all the time. You're going to need help. You should take help. You should ask for help. You should lean on your social circles and your community as much as you can. And you have to kind of recognize that again, and this kind of goes to some of the things that, that I was saying earlier, the way people perceive us is really important to us. And it's important to us throughout our life, but you know, especially when you're younger. As you get older, the way people perceive you becomes less and less important. To me, don't worry about how people perceive you. Worry about what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do for your child and for yourself. If you're not healthy, if you're not able to do the things that you need to do, you're not going to be able to be a good father. You're not going to be able to be a good husband. You're not going to be able to take care of your kid with special needs. And whatever tools are out there, 
you should really take advantage of, and you should not feel uncomfortable about how people perceive you. I'm a big, big believer that we were chosen, whatever that means, for this job, and that's our job. And that means that we have to do it, and whatever we have to do in order to make it through, feel good about doing that. Don't, don't feel bad about it. Feel good about it. And feel good about bringing your kid places and feel good about when he has a tantrum or a meltdown that somebody wants to be helpful. Now, sometimes people being helpful is like an atomic bomb and they don't fully understand how to be helpful. And you have to sometimes be tolerant of that and also be able to explain that. I once, we, we had a, a situation where we, we were trying to get my son to his bar mitzvah. And for years, the way we were getting him to his bar mitzvah is we were going to buy him a leaf blower. And uh, one of one of our close friends who's got a heart of gold at one particular occasion saw that my son was freaking out and about a leaf blower. He's like, oh, I'll just buy you a leaf blower. And I was like, what are you doing? You're like, we're, we've been working for two and a half years to get him to his bar mitzvah. You, you know, but there's a million examples of that where people sometimes do help in the wrong way. And you have to be able to tolerate it. You have to be able to absorb it. And you have to be able to, to have a perspective of even being grateful for it and explaining to people what the help is that you need. And, and what the help is that you don't need. But it's impossible. It's impossible to be able to, to go through this without help and a lot of it. So moving on to the religious aspect of this episode, and we'll see where this takes us. But in my experience, there are two transformations that happen to people who have big challenges. I'm sure there are many different categories of challenges and they affect people in different ways, but there are the people who get very angry or believe or their lack of belief in God creeps in and that becomes their reality. And for others, it becomes so obvious that God's hand is at play and they become so much more religious. I've seen it go both ways and usually in an extreme experience. So talk to me about your experience. You know, I, I don't think that my son has impacted me from a religious perspective. I think he's impacted me from an individual perspective. And what I mean by that is that I'm a totally different person than I than I once was, just entirely different. I think that because I'm different, my religious experience has changed. But I don't believe that God's role is to work for me. Religion to me is about duty and responsibility. And I have a duty and a responsibility based on my religious beliefs, irrespective of the challenges that I have. Do I look at my situation and view it that uh, I see God everywhere and constantly? No. Honestly, I'm a little too busy mentally, emotionally, and physically often to see almost anything. I like to give the example of my grandfather. All, my grand all of my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. And... Uh, there are times in my own experience when I feel really emotionally, physically exhausted. And I remind myself, I'm like, dude, you're the grandson of Holocaust survivors. Man it up and figure out how to get through this. Push forward. You can do it. My grandfather always used to say, as he got older, that the Abishter is not taking him because he's afraid of the Din Torah that my grandfather is going to take him to. He doesn't want to bring him because he knows when my grandfather gets there, the first thing that's happening is taking him to a Din Torah. And at the same time, my grandfather was a religious man. He went to shul. He did all the things he was supposed to do. And to me, there's always going to be mysteries in life in terms of why things happen, how they happen, and there's no way to answer them. And when you're pushed to an extreme, whatever that extreme might be in each person's life, you experience that in the extreme. You experience the mystery in the extreme. But for me, everything about life in theory, is, is footprints of God, right? The fact that you have a child with special needs and you go to sleep and you can literally feel your exhaustion in your bones, like you can barely move. And then you wake up in the morning and you can actually get out of bed. And I tell this to my kids, I'm like, it's like a crazy miracle. Like we're like cell phones, right? The cell phone dies, just plug it in. And then like all of a sudden, like, oh, you work again. You can see God in a variety of different ways. And for me, I think that I've always been somewhat balanced in terms of my religious experience, always looking to grow, always looking to take steps forward. But I, I haven't allowed this to push me in an extreme in either direction. Where I've allowed it to push me in an extreme is in the individual that I want to be and the person that I think I need to be. That to me is about 
others. I would say the greatest shift in my religious experience is that I've come to realize that the most important part of my religious experience is actually between me and my fellow man, not I, I often say that there's no aspect of our relationship with God in terms of the things we're supposed to do that are logical or intuitive. If I were to tell somebody that as an observant Jew, you can't turn on a light and try to now explain that to somebody and the impact that it has, it, it obviously, there's nothing logical. It makes no sense. And moreover, if I think that it, it is so significant, that's probably a violation of the fact that I'm supposed to believe that nothing that I do and nothing that I can do impacts God because God doesn't need anybody or anything. Obviously, we have to keep the mitzvahs and obviously we have to do the things we have to do. But the aspects are always going to be mysterious in some way. We're never going to fully understand them. And I choose to say that that's true with regard to my overall challenge. In the same way, I can't understand why any aspect of my relationship with God is meaningful or matters from a detailed perspective. I just can't understand that. I can't understand why the things happen to me happen to me. And, and maybe they happen because God is a little bit removed in that sense. There is, there is a train of thought within Jewish thought that God is not involved literally in every single detail. Hashkafa doesn't mean that 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 Hakadosh Baruch Hu chose every last little thing. And maybe maybe that there's some truth to that also. But even if you assume Hashkafa in in every detail, I I choose to to attribute this to the general mystery. But what isn't a mystery? What is logical? What is intuitive? What does make sense? Is I have to be kind and good. That makes perfect sense. And I don't need the Torah to tell me that, even though the Torah does tell me that. And my experience with my son really hyper-focused me on that because my, my life experience has become about others through my son and because of my son. And that's kind of opened up for me a perspective that I think is often lost, where people are so hyper-focused on the Bain Adam Lamaklam aspects of, of their religious experience, which again, are critical and it's part of the experience and we have to, we have to do it. But... It's clear to me that God, what he wants most from us is to be good to others and to focus our energies on others. And I would say for me, that, that's been the biggest shift in, in the way that my religious experience has changed in my life experience. It's gone from a life of being more self-absorbed, more self-centered to looking outward more. And my religious experience has been that way also. So let me focus a little bit deeper into the religious experience, into the practical sense. And... I've never heard about this talked about in general, maybe because it's not normalized. Maybe no one ever talks about it, but how it's like impossible to get to Minyan after you have a baby. And for some people, it's longer than others. So talk to me about your religious observance that just doesn't happen like other people because of your life, because of Yonatan. Uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's funny that you're asking me that. I, there's many, we all many pretend things. that everybody just makes it three times a day to Minyan. I mean, now I've heard like, oh, I'm looking for someone, whatever, but I don't make it to Minyan three times a day. And like, I hear that now more of, it's almost like Shomer Nagin, not Shomer Nagin. Don't tell people you're not Shomer Alacha. Like, don't make a term of it. But also, it's crazy to think that people make it to Minyan three times a day when their life's upside down because somebody needs them 24-7. Right. I, I could tell you I do not make it to Minion three times a day. On a normal day, I do not make it to Minion at all. Sometimes I'll get to a Mincha. Shabbos, I daven, I used to daven Shachris on the run and not in a Minion, but with my son on the run. More recently, I actually started to daven more like a mensch in my house, Shachris. Generally, I'll end up davening Musaf on Shabbos at Mincha because Freddie has Yonatan. Many, many years, I didn't hear Megillah both times. Maybe I hear it at night, maybe I hear it during the day. But that all kind of goes into what we were just talking about, which is how do you view your religious experience? You know, for me, the toughest aspect of my religious experience is that when you're trained to believe, and I think there is some truth to this, but when you're trained to believe that the way we, we have a relationship with God is through observance of mitzvahs and learning Torah and engaging in those kinds of things, well, now how do you view it in terms of these people who don't have that capacity? How do you view the religious experience of those people? And what does it mean in terms of my own religious experience? Does it mean that, well, my son is not, is likely not five in mitzvahs or maybe isn't five in mitzvahs. So 
I am. So I have to always prioritize myself and essentially say his experience isn't really meaningful. And that has implications in general in terms of how we view these people. If, if we view these people as being more rabbis have told me this, and I'll be honest, I, I, I view it and I don't like hearing this, although it could be true, but I personally, it doesn't feel good to me. But people will tell you that the purpose of these people is the fest that they create and what happens around them. And if I were to tell this to any, what I call thinking individual, that their entire purpose is only for what happens around them, obviously they're not going to like that. And it doesn't seem, it doesn't fit. And for a long time, I found myself struggling with that. And there are major implications to that. Because again, in terms of mitzvah observance, if one believes that, then all of my obligations, responsibilities have to be prioritized. But if you don't believe that, if you believe that these people have some sort of a significance and religious expression, then suddenly, you know, maybe there are times that their experience needs to be prioritized. And obviously, as a parent, you want to try to give your children as much as you possibly can. Over the years, I've developed my own personal approach and what I'd call the, the source kind of behind it that really motivated me is the comment that the Ramban makes in his introduction to his commentary on the Chumash. And he says there that Moshe Rabbeinu achieved the greatest spiritual levels that are available to mankind. At the same time, the Ramban writes in a number of places that you can't fulfill an obligation to its fullest degree outside of Israel. And yet Moshe Rabbeinu never went into Israel. So the person who we look at as being the greatest model of spiritual success is a person who is severely impaired and limited in terms of his ability to accomplish even one mitzvah. Each of us today can walk to, go to Eretz Israel, can do a mitzvah in a way that Moshe Rabbeinu never could, which clearly indicates to me that it's not about racking up points. It's not about how many mitzvahs did I do and how many bad things did I do. Ultimately, and, and, and this is true in life, for a typical person, an atypical person, it's about the human being that we become and that we are. And each of us has different abilities in terms of that. You know, some people are going to have much greater abilities and much, some people are going to have much lesser abilities. My son's ability to give is going to be different than my ability to give. But ultimately, the experience is about the individual we become. And that's what, what ultimately God looks at at the end. That's why you can have, as the Gemara and Avodah describes, people who are Kona Olama B'Sha'afas, people who, who acquire their, their portion in the world to come in a moment. Because that moment changed who they were. That moment defined them as a new person. Our job is to try to spend our life doing that. And for me, if I make it to Minion or I don't make it to Minion, that's an insignificant issue in the realm of the big picture of what I'm trying to do and the person that I'm trying to become. And I'm not trying to say a person shouldn't go to Minion. A person should try to do everything that they can as best as they possibly can. But when you look at, at our religious experience from a much more broader perspective, is it more important that I go to Minion and when I go to Minion, leave four children, including one with special needs, with my wife, who is going to have to deal with absolutely everything, which means that the rest of her day is going to be really, really difficult because she's spending all of her time dealing with this. And it's not easy. It's very hard to do a lot of the things. Or do I say that my obligations to, to my wife and to my children and to my son under my circumstance are far more significant? And to me, you know, it may not have been obvious the first time that I skipped something or I didn't do something. But it's become obvious today that God isn't looking at each detail of each thing that I'm doing and saying, okay, that's good, that's bad. It's not what's happening. There's always a conflict of values in life, and that's the hardest thing to manage and to say, I have these two values that are important, but I can't accomplish them both. What do I have to do? And God has given us the framework through Torah, through mitzvahs, through our minds to be able to make those judgment calls, to recognize when it's important and when I need to push. You know, a rabbi once said to me when I was asking the very question about Minion, he said to me, on Shabbos, you should be with your son. There's no question. But on, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you should make sure that you go to shul and, and you're not with your son. That Those two days, he said to me, the value of those two days in his mind superseded. So you're, you're always going to have, you know, judgment calls that you have to make in terms of that. But ultimately... It, it's more of a religious experience to me to be with my son. And somebody actually once said to me, another person when I was talking about these similar things, and it was a beautiful idea. And he said to me, you know, when you're walking with your son on Shabbos and you're not in shul, tell the Kaddish Baruch Hu, say to him, my son wants to daven and I want to daven, but neither of us can. So what we're doing now is our tefillah. 
We're davening because we want to daven. And we're telling you, I'm telling you, that the same way my son wants to daven and he can't, I want to daven and I can't. And there's a, there's a really profound message in that, in that there are many times in life, special needs or not, where we're doing things because we're in a situation that prevents us from doing other things that maybe we would prefer to do, maybe are more enjoyable to do, whatever it is. But we can't do it. And the thing that we're doing in place of it, which has meaning and depth and is important, that in itself has tremendous significance, even religiously. And, and I, I'm a very big believer of that. I appreciate you saying a lot of those things. And before we end, do you have any, so it's a two-sided question, one, words of advice or any areas of awareness that you'd like to bring out? And number two, knowing that this is a long-term, you know, most parents, the way traditionally parenthood is set up, is there's a limited amount of time to take care of your kids and then they become independent knowing that Yonatan will not be able to take care of himself or be self fully self-sufficient, and this is long-term. Are, are there any thoughts that you would like to share about that? Um, that's a very hard question. And maybe you don't think about it. Well, you know, I, I recently wrote something where I kind of described how, you know, when you have a child with special needs, on the one hand, every moment of every day spent with your child is deliberate and thoughtful because there are so many things that can trigger a variety of consequences, positive or negative, the clothes you wear, the places you go, you know, who you go with, how you go, L literally everything, the sounds around you, everything impacts. At the same time, despite all of the deliberation and thoughtfulness that go around trying to plan those moments, there's no, you know, we don't have the luxury of planning and thoughtfulness because every moment changes and at every second, something new, no matter how much you planned and how much you deliberated can still be a trigger. And it's something you've never even seen and never understood. And the challenge is constantly evolving. So the issues you have with an 18 year old are far different than those of a five year old. So on the one hand, we think about it every day and I'm constantly thinking about what will be in his future at the same time. So much of my energy is focused on the present. For me, it's a hard thought personally because my whole life has become about more or less my son and just making sure he has a good quality of life and taking care of him. And the thought for me of not having that in some manner, in other words, some people think about finding a place for their children to live at some point so they could have some more independence or things like that. There's a certain selfish aspect to my journey in that it gives me so much meaning and it provides me with so much spiritual, emotional satisfaction that it's a hard thing to think about. The other side to it is that, of course, you know, you have to figure out ways that your children will have best quality of life when you're here and when you're not. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what to accomplish that. I hope that my children, my other children are learning about compassion and kindness and caring, and they're going to want to be part of that, the journey for my son. We started to think about the possibility of places where he could live outside of the house with, with some form of, of independence where that would be a, more of a long-term solution. But I'll be honest, for me, and I would say this is the hardest question that you've asked me. Life without Yonatan is, I, I can't even imagine it. I, I don't even know how to think about it. And yet we do think about it. And my wife spends a lot of time thinking about it. So I, I don't really have any good advice with regard to that. And I don't have an answer myself. But as I said, the problems and the challenges take on new meaning as they get older. That's one of them. You know, how do you begin to secure your children's future? And that's true. You know, your other children will have hopefully the independence and you've given them the tools. They can do it on their own. These children don't have that. So hopefully they'll be able to lean on your other children. And, but I don't know, you know, I don't know. I don't want to pretend to try to, you know, give an answer to something that I simply don't know. I told someone very recently that sometimes when you ask hard questions and the questions about God, sometimes are the same, you know, authenticity is to say you don't know. And sometimes that provides a lot more truth to everything else than to try to sugarcoat and pretend you have an answer to something, which then tends to kind of undermine everything else. And in this one, it's a hard question. And if there's someone out there who has a good solution or an answer, I'd be, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. And, and it's a part of the puzzle. It's a part of the experience is that there's this reality. So 
even if there is no answer, the question is still there and I wanted to bring it up. No, I think it's it's an important question. And I think, to be honest, for listeners, it's an important question because part of the role of community ultimately is to take care of these people because we can't do it on our own forever. We can't do it on our own now. And and this you know goes back to your, your question and discussion about help. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. We go to the doctor when we need to go to the doctor. We go to the bank when we need a loan for a business transaction. You know, in, in every area of our life, we're comfortable looking for help. And we may not frame it as help, but that's what it is. And in this regard, it's no different. And I think that as a firm community in particular, we've come a long way in terms of providing resources and helping. We still have a long way to go, but this is one area that ultimately community has to think about in addition to us as parents, because my other children aren't going to be here forever either. And God forbid, if my son were alone, what would happen? Who would take care of him? Who would be responsible? And as a member of Klal Israel, to some degree, that, that's, that, that burden is theirs. And I do think that it's important for there to be in every community places where, where kids like this and adults like this and individuals like this could go. It doesn't mean that every family is going to choose to send their children there, they're, they're to send these people there. But, but I do think that the same way that we have yeshivas in all of our communities and all the other things that we have, there have to be places in our communities where somebody could send somebody who can't take care of themselves. I don't have a good answer to that. Any closing remarks? The only closing remark is that it's really important to try to look at things from a, a broad perspective. And it's hard sometimes because your whole life becomes narrowed because of sometimes the challenges that you're facing. And it's very hard to take a broad perspective and to look at things from a broader perspective. And in special needs, one of the unique parts of the challenge is that it only intensifies, it only becomes bigger, and it never goes away. But at the same time, to, to recognize that as challenging as it is, as difficult as it is, and again, I'm, I'm not that far along in my journey. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more to come. But to have a tsar or surus, as they say, and that surus is something that you love, that's really surin shalava. There, there's something amazing about that. There's such a tremendous bracha in being able to recognize that your challenge and your struggles, you get to love. And I think that from that prism, again, it doesn't change the day-to-day -day battle. And that's what it is. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat every day. If you had another 50 hours, I could probably tell you 3% of the crazy stories that we have to deal with all the time. Okay, we could do two, three stories. Okay, I'll give you one very kind of a silly story, okay? But I was once with my son, and this is not so long ago, in shul, and he had an accident. And I had to take him into the, into the bathroom, and I had to figure out how to change him. Now, my son's 18 years old now, and I'm sure you and your listeners have been in stalls, right? Public bathroom stalls. I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to figure out how to navigate so I can get his clothes off and to try to help him. And I finally do that, and I look to my left, and I see those squares. You know those squares that they have for toilet paper in some of these places because they don't have, like, normal Shabbos. toilet paper? Yeah, like those the little Shabbos. squares. Okay. And I'm thinking to myself, as I'm faced with this huge mess, and I could barely move, what am I going to do with these squares? Like, how am I going to clean my kid with these squares? Like, I, you know, on a good day, what am I going to do? So... I realized I have to figure out now how to get out and even just getting out and maneuvering with the door and trying to get around and basically both begging my son and also putting the fear of God into him that if he moves, I'm going to kill him. So he just stays in the stall. I now have to figure out how to run out and find someone who's got wipes. Now, the truth is, after 18 years, you'd expect I would be prepared, which I usually am. Happens to be that my son was looking for something. Uh, he was looking for my wallet because he likes to steal my credit card now. And he dumped out my the stuff in my backpack that had all of the things and it wasn't in there and I didn't have it. Now, I had to figure out how to, how to manage that circumstance. And there's circumstances like that all the time. My son likes to steal our credit cards now. My son, who is on my phone, figured out magically how to use Amazon and ordered five little tractors that you sit on and drive at 500 bucks a pop. And I didn't know. Were you able to return them? So the, the, the answer is we were able to return all of them but one. But one, 
one they, they, they suck us with. But it's literally hand-to-hand combat, and it's things you don't expect. It's things that, that people don't think about. You know, I had to, my son has regular dental work, and uh, the dentist could barely get in there to do anything. And he said to us at some point, you should probably think about doing like a real cleaning for him. So this year, he decided we should do it. And after they did they, their initial exam, my son was put under general anesthesia. He had tubes coming out of everywhere. And from 8 o'clock until 5.30, 8 o'clock until 5.30, he was out and they were working on his teeth. And that was just the bottom teeth. He then had to do that again for the second. So I'm not going to get into the costs and all that, which were crazy. Now, I mean, you can send many kids to it for, for yeshiva tuition for what it cost us. But just the fact that our son had to be put out and having to see that and watch that. And it was just, that was what we would call for him is that that's going to be what they call routine dental care now. He's a child who's had routine dental care his entire life. It's hand-to-hand combat. And there's new things that you just don't think about that just happen. And the things that you did prepare for, like having his bag. And we're so, we're, we're so meticulous. The bag, when I go with him anywhere, I have a change of clothes. And the change of clothes are in a big Ziploc bag. And the reason they're in a big Ziploc bag is because when I dump out the bag with all of his clothes, I can now take the other bag and either can throw up in it or I can put the dirty stuff into it, zip it. It doesn't affect it. Everything is thought through. And despite the fact that everything is thought through, half the time, if not more, it just doesn't work out that way. And you're stuck in a situation where you're in hand-to-hand combat. But when you're in that, and it's, it's hard, and I don't want to make it seem to you or anybody else that I sit there and I smile through it. I don't. And I feel sorry for myself sometimes. And sometimes I want to cry. And sometimes I do cry. But in the end of the day, as you get older, you see the experiences that people have. And most difficult experiences that people have, all they want is for those experiences just to go away. My son, I love. I don't want my son to go away. My son has brought incredible meaning into my life. My son has changed the person that I am. As I say, the tragedy of me is I could have chosen to be that person anyways. And everybody should choose to be that person anyways. But it's still a tremendous, tremendous bracha to be able to recognize that you get to love your challenge. You get to love your struggle. And it's it's hard. If you're able to try to broaden out the experience and to see the fact that you do get to love your child you get to see how every little moment of progress is so incredibly beautiful. And what that means for you as a typical person and your children, your other children as typical people, and appreciate all of those things, it just brings so much more meaning into your life. And it's no longer just about what can I do today to make myself feel good? And what can I do today to have fun? And what can I do today for myself? And it just brings a tremendous amount of meaning to life. And obviously not every difficult experience shares those qualities. And I recognize that. But for those who are able to do that, I think it just adds a tremendous amount of meaning and also appreciation for the difficult situation that you're in. Thank you so much, Ari. This has been such an unbelievable conversation. I learned so much and thank you. My pleasure. I hope uh, hope it's impactful to someone. Thanks so much for listening until the end. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you follow this show wherever you're listening to it so you don't miss an episode. Talk about this show with your friends, with your family members, and join the WhatsApp discussion group if you'd like to continue the conversation. Just message me. My email is in the show notes. This is a Jewish Coffee House Network podcast, so check out the other podcasts on the network. Thank you to the sponsor for last week's episode, and if you'd like to be a sponsor on a future episode, please reach out. We'd love to make this happen. And see you next week. 